Today is going to look like it was done at the last minute because it was. Not just me. But then we had the whole Chicago thing on top of it. Yeah. So that's a good excuse for you. You're good. Yeah, me know where Yeah, your whole email is Yeah. Oh, everyone can see my email. Great. Thank you for telling me. That is, you're right. You know, when the, when the lights, we can bring the lights down a little bit. Oh, there we go. This is the audio cable? Yeah. It's got to be that size, huh? Let's make sure it's... Oh, that's not it. Yeah. Here you go. Here you go. Ah, got it. So I think we're good. I'll just double check the other two real quick and Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? 
We're having a few audio difficulties. Can you hear me in the back, everybody? Excellent. Um, welcome to uh, the Future of Digital Media uh, panel. Um, a few of us were stuck in Chicago, just so you know. I actually got in at 3 in the morning. <laughs> uh, Larry Herb over here is from Xbox, got in at 1 in the morning. Mitch Gelman drove with me from Chicago for about uh, 12 hours. So we may be a little bit, you may see a, a sipping coffee and things like that. If you see anybody nodding off, please go get them coffee and bring it. <laughs> We'd really appreciate it. Uh, but we're really excited to be here, even though we're running adre an adrenaline. Um, I think that actually uh, this kind of uh, um, you know, uh, you know, passion for what we're doing, it really speaks to the way digital media rolls. We, uh, we roll with punches. Um, so we're here uh, as, uh, to, to, of course, open the exciting new uh, uh, Newhouse um, uh, uh, Dick Clark uh, Studio and uh, Alan Gary Center for Media Innovation. Um, today we're going to be talking about the media innovation side primarily. And just to kind of set the stage here, uh, digital media, I think most of you are aware, um, initially grew out of traditional media forms that are encapsulated in all the Newhouse majors. So, you know, written content, broadcast journalism, television, radio, and film. But it didn't stop there. And digital is now really emerging as its own uh, native form, fundamentally different from those legacy forms. Um, it has, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the dif differences. Unlimited inventory of content, right? That's different. Uh, it's interactive and participatory. It's about people. Um, uh, media is not just a one-way street anymore. Um, anybody can then share their voice. And in fact, throughout this panel, I want you all who have uh, Twitter accounts or Facebook or any kind of social media, Google+, feel free to participate um, by posing your own questions when we open up, up the, uh, the floor for questions. Uh, you can, um, for our uh, Newhouse students up here could, with the microphones, different times they'll be roaming around. If you want to ask a question in person, Feel free to uh, get their attention. But you can also just open uh, Twitter or Google Plus or Facebook and just write uh, your question. If you use FD Media, stands for Future of Digital Media, so really easy to remember, then our social media team up in the front here of uh, students from the ICC 505 Web Journalism class will be monitoring that and I'll be looking for your questions. So this is a very participatory event um, that I think speaks to the way digital media works today. Um, <clears throat> to the newcomer of uh, uh, looking at digital media the first time, it can look like one big washing machine, really, where everything, all the rules that made things work in the past are turned upside down. And as soon as they turn, they just turn again and again and again. Uh, innovation never stops. It's always changing. Um, to some, that's, that's a little bit scary. Uh, but the people on this panel uh, who come from uh, um, some really interesting companies, they're used to that cycle of constant change, and they've learned to do more than just be comfortable with it. They, they are the ones who are harnessing that creative energy to make entirely new types of media products and services. Um, and and they're, they're, it's, it's working very well for them. Um, I contrast that to, uh, to maybe some of the traditional uh, media professionals you read about who are losing jobs that are out of date. Um, unlike them, these leaders here on the stage are creating jobs that we never even imagined a few years ago. And they'll be giving you some examples of those in, in, um, as you see what, they, what they're showing. So I want to uh, introduce them from uh, uh, right near me. We have Christina Hahn, who is the uh, 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 director of uh, consumer packaged goods at Google. I'm also very involved in YouTube, and she's going to be sharing a lot about YouTube and what's different about that. Uh, we have uh, Larry Herb, uh, the director of uh, digital entertainment and, I'm sorry, we changed our order. Uh, Larry here, uh, the director of programming for Microsoft's Xbox Live. Do you have any gamers here? Uh, anybody with, uh, who, who watches streaming video, uh, perhaps, on an Xbox? Larry's kind of all over that. Uh, we've got uh, Mitch Gelman on the, uh, the journalism side at Gannett Digital, the VP of product in Gannett Digital, and he's going to talk about some innovative products, one of which I and a student named Irfan Arezi helped out with this summer that speaks to really, I think, what the Gary Center for Media Innovation will make more possible uh, in the coming years. And then Ed Wise, um, 
the Senior Vice President of Digital and Branded Entertainment for Turner. Um, also was very involved in a little site called funnyordie.com, uh, so he may get some of the laughs uh, today. Um, although maybe it's a challenge to the rest of you. Who can get more laughs than the funny or die guy, right? Um, so with that, and by the way, my name is Dan Pacheco. I am the, chair, the uh, Peter Horvitz Chair of Journalism Innovation. I believe Mr. Horvitz is here. Uh, he said hello earlier, right there. Uh, somebody who uh, really uh, did a lot of innovative things in the newspaper industry, is a Newhouse alum, and then went on to fund my chair, which allows me to, uh, to help students and faculty here really step outside of the comfort zone and think about the future of digital media. So thank you, Mr. Horvitz. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christina. So Christina, would you like to come up here or can I, how about I bring your presentation up? Uh, yeah, if you bring it up, I think we should be fine. I can just sit hey, right here because I can see. you can bring see. the lights down a little bit, uh, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Can get back to the beginning. Can you go to the? Uh, we're missing a. You're, you're like on slide 10. You can get to the first slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> There so we go. talking about the future of media, and uh, as Dan was saying, I mean, innovation is moving at such a fast clip. Uh, two things just to think about and how much technology has changed our world. It took the United States 50 years to double their GDP, and it took China only 15. And it took 80 years to get 80% market penetration for air conditioning, but it's only taken 10 years to get 80% penetration of smartphones. So that's how quick things are going. In fact, when I sat here at Newhouse, Google did not exist. And um, you know, when we first launched, if you go to the next slide, this is what the search engine looked like. Very simple, you know, very basic logo, limited information there. And we've now evolved into, the next slide. Uh, a much more robust search results page. So on the right, you see our knowledge graph, or if you Google Syracuse University, it's giving you information that it, it's surfacing what you might want to know. It's giving you the address, it's giving you the phone number. On the left, it shows you the two, <coughs> excuse me, main links that you would maybe want to go to on the Syracuse University page, admissions, new house. And then um, it also has a search engine bar right there that you can search the Syracuse website right from the Google page. So making it easier, surfacing up information so it's, you don't even have to click through, you can get what you want right in that moment. And we've seen, you know, this is just the desktop evolution, but we've seen massive evolution as well on the mobile page. The next slide. So mobile first started out SMS text, where you could text Google and you'd get a basic response. Then we moved into um, you know, mobile web browsing with the BlackBerry. And now we have a much more robust, when the iPhone launched and now with Android, where you have a full web browsing experience. So that's what you're seeing there. And we're gonna, by the end of the year, we believe in most parts of the world, mobile search will sur surpass desktop search. And because of the connectivity of mobile, since 2010, internet usage is up 100%. So with that, with more people being on the internet, um, of course we're seeing more and more search. So Google sees 100 billion searches per month. And what I think is so fascinating is that 15% of those searches have never been seen before. Pretty amazing. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. So how do we keep up with that? And how do we, you know, that we have all these new people searching, there's new connectivity with mobile. So we have uh, three core fundamentals that we're thinking about to make sure that we're building the best search engine possible in order to make sure we're giving people the answers that they want when they're reaching out. So um, answer could seem, you know, pretty general and, and easy, but, it, you know, Search message, like when you're doing a search query, it's just a bunch of text, it's just a bunch of words. It's hard to tell sort of what the intent is behind that. So if I search for kings, um, Google doesn't know if I mean the Sacramento kings, the LA kings, or if I mean kings, the supermarket, which is down the block from me in Hoboken. So we're trying to use different uh, information, people, places, trying to understand the habits of our users in order to figure out what is the right Kings so that me, Christina Hahn, when I search for Kings, they do know that I live in Hoboken and I'm probably talking about the supermarket. Converse, so we now have this new functionality on phone. You know, With your phone, you have a whole different level of connectivity. 
And we can now just press a button and I can say, Google, what is the weather in Syracuse? Oh, hold on. Google, what is the weather in Syracuse? I had the volume too low, sorry about that. But it's cloudy. In but it's saying it's cloudy in Syracuse. So it's giving you the weather in I, Syracuse. I could have predicted that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yes, but you can now have a conversation with Google. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're surfacing the right information there, that someone could be standing in front of the Empire State Building and say, Google, how tall is the Empire State Building? And then uh, anticipate. So this one is, I was flying here from Newark. So I booked my flight on United, and I get a confirmation on my Gmail account. So Google knows that I am flying to Syracuse. So it can anticipate using Google now that I'm going to care about what the weather is in Syracuse. So on Sunday morning when I woke up and I go to my Google Now page, it's surfacing the weather to me without me even asking for it. It's anticipating my needs. So those are the three core fundamentals of search of what we're thinking about right now. Um, moving on to YouTube, YouTube has also seen a, a massive, massive, uh, like I should say, like revolution in terms of when we first started, which is on the next slide where we just had a, a bouncing cat going across the screen to a funky song that got a ridiculous amount of views. And Charlie Bit My Finger. How many people have seen the Charlie Bit My Finger video? It was one of the most popular back in the early days. To where we are now, which is having a channels system where we have 30 channels that have, have over 1 billion views. 60 of them um, have more than 5 million subscribers which is just amazing, like that's their fan base. Over five million people are subscribed to their channel. Next slide. How many people know who this person is? I'm curious. Do we have anybody? Oh, we've got one right, a couple. All right, so we have a few motivators. That's uh, Bethany Moda, and her fans are called motivators. So Bethany Moda joined YouTube in 2009 as a teenager to escape from bullying. And she built up this great fan base, so much that Aeropostal realized that she was growing on YouTube. And they reached out to her and she launched a clothing line with Aeropostale. And she started doing live appearances in the mall and thousands of screaming teenagers would show up. And she's become so popular that she actually is on the new season of Dancing with the Stars. And um, she is on the cover of Seventeen magazine just this month. So you're seeing the transition from traditional media and old, you know, old, traditional media and new world media being Bethany being a, a YouTube star. What's amazing about her fan base, though, is for every 1,000 views that she gets, she gets 500 comments. So that gets back to the whole participation age that we're in right now. Pretty amazing. It's, I mean, that 1,000 views, 500 comments. So we'll flip to the next slide, and you can see what, what's amazing about her being on Seventeen Magazine is that Seventeen then flipped it on its head and said, we're going to create a YouTube issue. So this is their first YouTube issue. You have Bethany Moda up top. And it's specifically built for YouTube. where It's 17 magazine content, but in video format. On the next slide, you'll see that there's content from Bethany, but then they're also curating, which is another big thing of this generation, curating topics from other content creators that they know that the 17 reader and now you know, YouTube watcher is going to be interested in. And um, you know, obviously Bethany's participating in there too, and she's tapping into her community because it's so large. So um, it's just it's very interesting to see Seventeen tapping into Bethany's audience and creating a, a, a whole YouTube channel and a YouTube issue. Moving on to news, um, this is a uh, oh yeah, did it get cut off a little? We have a little bit of formatting issues there. It looks like oh no, it's okay there. Um, so news has become a really hot. Um, area for us, a growth area on YouTube. In fact, one out of every three searches on YouTube is related to news content. Um, and what I think is just very different is an, an audience is like told when to tune in and then they, they watch at a specific time. Whereas a fan base, just they want the information when they want it, at the, you know, and on any device that they can get it. So, the, you know, they're turning to YouTube to get their current events and news. And over 7,000 hours of news content is uploaded every day. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, I don't think it's a secret. Most people do know that uh, younger generations are not watching news on television in the traditional forms. The average age on CNN is 65. Average age on Fox is 62. Um, you know, 50% of 18 to 49 year olds say that they're watching video online. So here's the trends that um, we see. If you want to go to the next slide, in regards to news. 
Is this a video? Nope, it's not a video yet. You can keep going. Getting lots of tweets coming in on my phone right now. <laughs> Let me lower that. Oh. There we go. Okay, so the number one trend that we're seeing is YouTube Live. So um, we're seeing live reports coming out of Ferguson, coming from the Ukraine, down in Venezuela. Um, YouTube's live streaming technology has gotten a lot better over the last 18 months, so a lot of our content partners sign up for it. They use Google Hangouts, they're using YouTube Live Stream, and they're, they're bringing live content. And you know, each individual live stream might not seem like it's that big, but when you add all those views together, you have your next Red Bull, Red Bull stratosphere moment where he when you know when they jumped from space like the numbers are that big in aggregate of how many people are watching live news on YouTube next slide second trend is news built specifically for YouTube so um, one of the biggest news guys on YouTube is obviously vice news uh, which is being run by a new house alum and um, so Vice has a lot of content on there, but then we're also seeing partners like the BBC that are creating content specifically for YouTube that's outside of what they air in their traditional broadcast. Next trend. Uh, another hot trend that we're seeing is the daily roundup. So um, for those of you that do not subscribe to YouTube uh, Nation, you should. It's a great little uh, you know, recap of what's going on on YouTube. And then we also have um, a great content creator in the Young Turks, which twice a week they put out a, it's only 140 seconds. So in 140 seconds, you can get all of the most important news that you want to know about that week. So all of the top stories. So it's easy for someone to just go on and, and catch up on their news in, in 140 seconds. Trend number four, long form news. This was amazing to me too. The, uh, the length of what people are watching in terms of news is 17 minutes. So I think a lot of people always thought who was going to watch long form online, but they are now, 17 minutes. And we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, this is an example showing the New York Times, some of the big major, you know, traditional news carriers will air a story or print a story and then they'll use YouTube to do the longer version of it and, and have more content out there on YouTube. And then uh, trend number five is um, industry respected journalism. So looking at uh, an organization like Truth Loader, which I think it's best if we just show the video and Truth Loader can explain what they're doing. They're out of um, ITN. Oh, got the uh, link? Yeah, go to the video. Got it. it should be on your web browser, not, not this, that uh, one. This one? That one, yeah, go it. ahead. Perfect. Sorry, we're having a, all right. Oh, oh. It's not on YouTube, so it's not working. <laughs> Let's try it again. Truth Loader is a new YouTube channel using citizen journalism to make better sense of this world. We've seen some incredible videos coming out of the conflict in Syria. And we've also seen some amazing footage come out of the Israel-Palestine conflict that you are not likely to have seen anywhere else. We're also bringing you the stranger videos that bubble up online, like this video showing every single plane landing into San Diego airport over five hours. As well as all this, Truth Loader investigates, which takes a look at some of the things you are not likely to see on the mainstream news. Like this guy, who ordered drugs from a massive online black market and then filmed himself taking them and posted the video online. Truth Loader investigates also spoke to a scientist with links to NASA who said that he's 95% sure there is life on Mars. We have a subreddit where you can submit ideas for stories and we will take a look at them and investigate them. If this wasn't enough, Truth Loader also hosts live debates on topics which our YouTube community decide. So don't miss out on Truth Loader. Okay, so um, before I close, and I'm going to show a video after that you'll get to see um, that we use at our, our big upfront. We participate in the digital upfront, so it's called Brandcast that we had in April, and it's a video just sort of putting together um, everything that YouTube is about, users, um, what our content creators are doing, how advertisers can interact with us. Um, but again, before, before we get to the video, I did just want to say to the students in the room, and, and there's a thing that we talk about at Google about being uncomfortably excited. So um, I don't know if you had that slide. I was just th oh, think think about yeah think about you know how you can be a disruptor. I mean when you think about what's happening right now, 
Uber has completely reinvented transportation. Tesla has completely reinvented making a car. So what, what can you guys do as these students, you know, with, with this power? Don't, don't be afraid to be disruptive. Don't be afraid to think out of the box. And don't, you know, be, be you should be uncomfortably excited about really being a disruptor in this space because there's so much potential for it. For the video? Yes. All right. gives us the opportunity to redefine the video experience for all of us. We're in the middle of a big revolution with video. It's all changing, and YouTube is playing a key role. And we are going to spotlight a young lady who has fans that don't just watch her on YouTube, they show up by the thousands. Content matters. So we curated Google Preferred. It's the top 5% of content on YouTube in areas like food, music, entertainment. It's a limited set of the most popular, engaging, and fast growing channels on our platform. on YouTube that we found our voice as a company. YouTube enabled us to experiment in a way that no other platform could. We had creative freedom. We could take our time to tell a story. We're at a historic moment in media. Young people are leaving TV in droves, and they're moving online. New brands are being created as we speak. Vice News has already been called <coughs> Time Warner of the Streets and the next CNN. With the scale that YouTube offers, we're not going to be the next CNN. We're going to be 10 times the next CNN. YouTube, in particular, connects us to consumers directly. And it allows us to be part of a conversation that's driving culture. And it's for that reason that our media investment <clears throat> in YouTube has increased 50% in the last year alone. YouTube today is easy to buy, easy to measure, and we guarantee the audience that you want. It's incredibly exciting to see the momentum that Google Preferred has already generated with brands like Johnson & Johnson and Heineken. Please welcome to the stage Tony Wiseman, CEO of Digitas LBI. The introduction of Google Preferred is undeniable evidence that there is scarcity in premium online video and it is a marketplace at an exciting tipping point. All right, thanks, Christina. So now we're going to open this up to uh, some questions. And um, our panelists, um, they're really open to all the panelists. Uh, we'll give the first panelists kind of the, uh, the chance to answer first. But if you all have questions, remember, you go to uh, the hashtag FD Media. If you search that, there, is t there are tons of questions already popping up. And uh, lots of, a lot of the, the stats that were shared are in there. So um, really great way to kind of follow up. Um, so, first question uh, uh, for, for Christina and our panelists. Um, how do you feel like this, de this democratization of video, right, which is really different from the traditional TV model, we have gatekeepers and just traditional media model, um, how does that change the dynamics of what's popular, right, and who are the new, are, who are the new gatekeepers and tastemakers, and, and do they exist anymore? Yeah, I mean, in, in my world, I think it just provides an opportunity for, for niche programming because there's no one that's going to shoot down your idea. You can use your GoPro camera. You can put up content. And as long as there's people who are actually watching it, you know, you, you can be a success. So I think it's rooted in fans, and they're really in control. But um, there's content on anything and everything on YouTube. So I think that... It takes away, you know, in, in talking to some of the big guys from, from Hollywood, they love YouTube as a platform because they can 
create some content, get some feedback on it, see what's working, change it in real time, and not be held to um, you know a big studio's you know prime time schedule and whether or not they're going to get canceled and what's working for the advertisers. They really have complete creative control. Anyone else want to weigh in? Here? Yeah, I'd like to add it. I think that um, you know you talked about who who are the gatekeepers. I think. It's it's we we are the gatekeepers. It's it's a full end-to-end -end democratization, you know, from the creative standpoint, all the way down into the programming standpoint. With the tools that are put online, with with YouTube and Google and everyone else, it's up to us to kind of go through and decide what we want to see. And those tools enable us to, to through some of the examples that Christina talked about earlier, whether it's through back-end machine automation, or whether it's through um, through peer-to-peer -peer conversations or tastemakers. It's really us. So the answer is is everyone. And I, I just want to add that I think when you look at the ability to find celebrities or um, you know bring a celebrity to the forefront, obviously digital gives you an, and the open door policy. So you're from an MCM perspective, you're finding all these new stars that are now evolving. I think when you look at traditional media, it's not going away. So like we we have to figure out a way that how does digital enhance all these other platforms, film. Um, TV, and then you look at you know access to content. So if you look at like uh, SVOD, how many people in the audience access Netflix on an ongoing basis? You know, there's the ability to get you what you want when you want it. I think is the key to content, and we shouldn't be protecting it. We should allow users to choose what they want when they want it, and that in 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 essence allows us to then discover more celebrities, more stars, more rising stars. So I think there's there's this whole like you know there's the TV everywhere concept that that Turner were a big believer in, but you know we want to give people their content where they want to watch it, and we like we love what YouTube does. We're a big fan. Like there's a for us, it's how to what Microsoft does from an Xbox like perspective. How do we take our content and amplify it through all these incredible distribution platforms? Yeah, which is really different from just trying to own everything and keep it all in a box, right? Um, just one thing I want to throw out there. I don't in case um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but. Uh, the number one search engine in the world is Google. You know what the number two is? YouTube, owned by Google. <laughs> kind of interesting. So uh, even if you have video, so you're, you're out there publishing video on your website and your blog or something, you still should be putting it in the place where people are looking for videos, especially the one-third of searches that are for news. That is a huge opportunity for journalists that is completely, I think, undertapped at this point. Um, so uh, um, while we're going through the other questions, um, please, if you have a question, raise your hand, and our, uh, our student hosts will bring the microphone to you. Why don't we, and we can, yeah, go ahead. There's one right in the back there. My question is sort of related. Um, I think that popularity when it comes to fashion or you know, music is fabulous. But when it comes to news, I think it's really troubling. And I wonder what, what comment you would have about that. I mean, the most popular news? I mean, it's just very, you know, I mean, popular doesn't equal valuable. It doesn't equal true. And I just, wow, you know, watching those videos, it's just kind of scary, I think, that, that people are going to choose what kind of news they're going to consume without any editorial, you know, value being placed on it. I don't know. I find that very troubling. I would argue that currently exists. I mean, when you look at blogs that are out there right now, um, it's up to the the reader, the consumer, to decide what they're going to trust. Um, and and I, I understand what you're saying because I remember sitting on my Twitter feed and seeing a lot of things come in from um, from Ferguson, and not knowing who was tweeting them out. If I didn't know who the journalist was or they weren't associated with a major publication. I started to question and say, like, is this even real? Is it a doctored photo? Uh, but I guess that it's in the user's hand to sort of question that. Um, you know, the, the content's going to be put out there, and I think it, that sort of content always existed. I mean, there, there's probably out people out there that consider news entertainment tonight, like let, being honest. I mean, so I think that um, it's, it, it's, I think it's in the hands of the user. I, I actually agree with you 100%. This is frightening. And here's why. Um, you're seeing some behavior in online writing, and I won't call it journalism, but you're seeing some behavior in online writing that is for one reason and one reason only, and that is to incite clicks and traffic. And that's not news. 
Uh, again, I'm not calling it journalism because I'm a Newhouse grad. I have a higher bar of what I consider to be journalism. So I am very, very concerned about this. That there's this there's this uh, wave of 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 you know uncurated news, and let's go ahead and use the air quotes uh, that is that is b being made popular. When it's not news, it's just whatever the headline is. And we've seen all these BuzzFeed, you know, you'll never guess what so-and-so did. Is that news? I completely agree with you. Would you argue, though, at the same point, you you know, you're shopping for years and you look at the National Enquirer and some people actually think it's real. They look at that story. So you have to look at the audience and what they can interpret. You know, I think what we look at at CNN, um, you know, our, our audience in mobile is completely different uh, from an, uh, a demographic perspective than we see on TV. So I think there's, there are enough of a younger audience that is migrating and is choosing the source that they feel comfortable with. I don't think anyone's trying to pull the wool over their eyes. I think the, the lack, you know, and should there be censorship? I think everything's the interpretation of the, of the audience themselves. And, you know, Funny or Die is about to launch a news, a news um, well, call, let's call it a channel for the time being, but it's going to be accurate news, but it's going to be told in a funny lens that maybe there's an audience that wants to consume their news in a different, in a different way. So for me, at least, and again, just to throw it out from an, our, you know, to debate it, it's the audience is, is, is really smart, especially on the web. They are, they are a very savvy audience. You're not going to fool them. So I think it's important for them. They're going to they're go to the source where they want to consume their news and who they trust. And look, at the end of the day, this has been going on for years. I, I brought up the National Enquirer. This is not a new thing. Just, it's just at a different platform. I, but I think with that point, the, the National Enquirer, you look at that and you know that there's not a three-headed baby, right? <laughs> there's certain there's certain that they, they, there's certain things that you present there that that frankly common sense would would dictate. Oh, that's just that's just ridiculous. But now the lines have blurred so much that you look at something and go, well, maybe that that is true. I don't know. And sometimes you're right. Parts of the audience are very smart and very intelligent, and some unfortunately are not. I, I don't I don't know what this is doing. You're right. We're in the middle of this this real bizarre news blender and it's really it's really frightening to see where we're going to end. Yeah, I would just uh, add back to <laughs> back to what Ed was saying though. I mean, when when we look at YouTube, I mean the what's so important because of the community interaction and because of the fans is authenticity. So the minute any content creator, whether it's news or covering a, a game or something else, the minute they're viewed as not being authentic, their fan base just plummets, and they're nothing without their fan base. So I got that. so that's interesting you say that because we just we, you just showed the video with that young woman who was hired by um, by the by uh, was it Arab who was it Arab Sash. So I look at that and I wonder: Is the audience are those younger girls going to realize that she's being paid for that? And all of a sudden, wait a minute does she really like the clothes, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's because it's tr it's true to who she is. It's a brand that aligns well with who she is, so she has no problem putting her right. name against that, just like anyone else who does an endorsement in any advertisement sure. out there. Right. So, so this is a great conversation. We're going to continue conversation. But I can tell that our uh, 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 Mitch Gelman from Gannett, which is a news company, would like to get a word in, I think. I see the, I see the microphone popping up, and <laughs> then I think we'll move to the next topic, but we can definitely continue. Whose responsibility is that? Why did this happen? What did the traditional news organizations do or not do over the past 10 to 15 years that has created this vacuum that people from 12 to 29 or 29 through uh, 35 are trying to fill with a desire to know and to understand what's going on in their world in new ways. So before we indict the environment <coughs> in which this is occurring, I think we as news professionals need to ask ourselves, who's responsible for enabling this vacuum to exist and how can we participate with the journalistic values, with the principles, with the legacy concepts and knowledge that we want to share with people in the United States and around the world to power their ability to make smart decisions in democratic societies or to understand what's going on in non-democratic societies. What is our responsibility to help fill that vacuum and shape the change? I would argue perhaps that it's an environment that we as news professionals enabled 
to exist. All right, we are going to get back to news in just a, mo a moment here. Um, and actually, we'll just shift totally to, uh, uh, to the kind of opposite end of the spectrum. Um, Ed Wise from Turner is going to share a little bit about uh, funny content, entertainment, and also branded content. I think when, when I think I'm still on. Yeah, when we look at uh, advertising today, I think there's it, it, there's so many different ways to reach a consumer, and obviously their their behavioral habits are continually changing. Uh, where they um, go and get content, how they consume it, etc. So I think what we're going to talk about uh, in the next few minutes are going to be about branded content. Some people call it native content. I like to call it branded entertainment. I think the key is creating entertaining content and then putting a brand message inside of it. That's the success to branded, branded entertainment. If you produce branded content, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's content that has a brand all over it and you're not in, entertained and you're turned, you're turned off. So the, you know, we, we can keep on this, the authenticity of branded entertainment I think is key. And how do we make sure the user knows exactly what they're watching so they understand what they've signed up for. And I think at Funny or Die, we've done a really good job of creating compelling content with brand messaging inside of it. it it's, it's actually a business model we, we started for our company back in 2007. I used to have hair back then, it's gone now. And um, I know we're live streaming, so for my, uh, my PR team back in New York, uh, I work for Turner. Turner actually acquired part of Funny or Die about two years ago. And I think the, the beauty behind what Turner brings to the table is the amplification of that content. So across all of our uh, new sports entertainment properties, both digitally and on the linear side, we're able to take that content and w we can see that through our different channels. And we're not protected with our content. We love putting our content all over the web where it makes sense from a social perspective, from a, a digital perspective, from a linear perspective. So YouTube's a huge partner of ours, makes sense. Xbox is a big partner of ours, et cetera. So with that said, I think this video, our quick sizzle reel, and it's a tough act to follow YouTube because their, 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 final, their, uh, their new front uh, reel was phenomenal. But we'll give it a shot, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about branded entertainment. Okay, let's get this out of the way. What did you come here to plug? Have you heard of the Affordable Care Act? Oh, yeah, I heard about that. That's the thing that doesn't work. If we said that we're a website filled with hilarious content, yeah. A-list celebrities and top writers, producers, and directors, Cut. we'd be lying. <laughs> we're that and a whole lot more. More than just a website, Funny or Die is a definitive comedy brand. Focus! From day one... I got my money, money. They don't call me bitch, I'm a grown man! We've reinvented, redefined, and rewritten the comedy landscape. Watch <laughs> by developing our products, growing our brand, extending our reach, and becoming the number one comedy brand on social media. Yeah! They don't call me the viral hit machine for nothing. <laughs> We've become a branded entertainment powerhouse by utilizing some of the brightest comedy minds in the business to create premier custom content for advertisers that's unlike anything else yeah, we go again. and becoming a vital part of every brand's marketing strategy. To use it, you need two things, hands and this machine. This is what we do. Everyone else is just playing catch up. <laughs> Over the last seven years, we've become branded entertainment experts and have the hardware to prove it. This is your Oscar? Oh my God, that's what I'm talking about! <laughs> and build brand affinity with proven results. Let me grab this. Funny or Die is the pioneer okay. of branded entertainment and continues to evolve with new opportunities for advertisers. I think you're gonna like some of these. Like live events, tours, on air, social activations, tentpole editorial partnerships, and groundbreaking digital entertainment, just to name a few. More than just a video, Funny or Die provides 360 degree content opportunities to meet advertisers' evolving needs, making us the unrivaled, innovative leaders in the space. This is fun. <laughs> our partnership with Turner Broadcasting is an unparalleled offering in the marketplace among our competition. By combining superior creative production with the scale and distribution reach of Turner, don't you get it? No one else can deliver premium content. I am the guy on the standy! To a highly engaged, socially savvy audience across a wide reaching, multi platform network. The system works. Like funny or die. I'm gonna press this. Uh, don't touch that, please. All right, 
funny. Funny. We're, and we're still alive. So. Driving, driving up here uh, four hours from New York, and um, I, didn't, I didn't have the 10 or 12 hour drive from Chicago, but I was out till about 12 last night, so I apologize if there's a yawn coming in uh, here or there. But um, a friend of mine gave me a good quote from Morgan Spurlock, and um, he said, if you, can make them, if you can make them laugh, you can make them listen. I think that's super important. And I think when you're trying to talk about a brand message to an audience that it, it has so much going on, it's such a fragmented space, uh, attention is where, where it's at. I think the key to the success is actually creating great content. And I think, you know, you just saw f a few clips. We'll show you a couple examples in a minute. But I think that's the real key to the success of branded um, entertainment. And it really is, it's, it's an, it's, it seems like it's, um, it's really hard work, but it's not. A brand gives, gives us their brief, talk about what their objectives are. We go to our writers in Hollywood. They come up with all these great ideas, and then we'll execute it. Uh, it takes us probably six to eight weeks to pull this off. And I think the key to the success is not just the great content, it's the distribution and syndication that goes with that content. So how do you make sure this content is portable and lives everywhere? You know, we look at today's world where we'll now take a piece of content, we'll put it into, could be a, a chop it down to a vine, we could put it into a TV spot, um, et cetera. There's just a lot of ways to get that content out there. So for us, the key to success is really the distribution and syndication on top of producing great content. And we'll get into, I think, the, uh, the authenticity of knowing what's branded. So on, our, on Funny or Die, at least, on our site, we'll call it out as sponsored content. You, you, there's no tricks here. We're going to be very clear to the audience about what they're about to watch. I think there's two ways to really uh, make branded content. I think when, when it's not succe successful, it's when you're caught in the middle. We talk about, you know, you can put the brand way over the top. If you saw in Between Two Ferns with Speed Stick, the Speed Stick comes right down in the middle of Zach and his hosts, that's kind of over the top, but it's funny. So we're, we're not trying to hide the fact that this is brought to you by Speed Stick. If you want to see more episodes of Between Two Ferns, we have to pay, and Speed Stick's going to help us bring you those, those episodes. In other content, we'll weave, we'll weave the brand messaging through the storyline. So, so I think that's really important as well. So this is the other side of the house where it's not over the top, but it's a great way for us to get that brand messaging across. So with that said, we're going to show a clip about how we were able to do that, and then also how we use distribution platforms like news, so how do we marry comedy and news, to drive tune-in for a movie I hope some of you might have went to go see. Ron Burgundy. What hasn't been said about Ron Burgundy? He's a news legend. One of the most influential anchors in broadcast history. On camera, he's the best. But off camera, he's a bit of an a <laughs> A major <laughs> When we were coming up in the late 70s, Ron Burgundy got the lead anchor position at KVWN because his mustache was slightly bigger than mine. People found comfort in a mustached man delivering the news. I love my beard, but I would trade it for Burgundy's mustache in a heartbeat. You know, the truth is when I first graduated from college and I started reporting, I, I was just doing my best Ron Burgundy impression. I mean, everyone was back then, the mustache, the suit, the, the whole persona. Burgundy and I hit the national spotlight about the same time. Today, he has the most awards of any anchor. Some of them, honestly, I think, belong to me because they're literally mine. He just took them off my shelf right in front of me and acted like I didn't see it. The first job I had was as an intern for Ron Burgundy. They were the worst years of my life. He didn't trust any of the local dry cleaners, so he made me learn how to dry clean, and I had to buy a specialized machine and keep it in my studio apartment. When I started Anderson Cooper 360, Ron's shadow still loomed over the show. Literally, th there was a cardboard cutout of him in the studio blocking one of our lights. He, he had it in his contract that it could never be removed. It was a huge pain in the ass. He was always the first to break big stories. That's because a lot of the times, he caused them. I heard he suggested building a wall in Berlin just so he could deliver the news when it was knocked down. Before Mike Tyson fought Evander Holyfield, Ron told him in the locker room, and I'm quoting now, boxing isn't just about your fists, it's about your mind and your teeth. God, I wish I had thought of that. For three years, I thought I had a huge story about an affair between Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. 
Turned out my inside source was Burgundy pretending to be Deep Throat. He Deep Throated me for years. It was really humiliating. <laughs> to this day, he calls me Wolf Blister. He calls me Stoopy Andrews. It's not funny. It doesn't even sound like my name. He won't call me anything. He refuses to acknowledge me as a human being. Ron Burgundy literally tried to poison me. So I'm celebrating the premiere of New Day at Leeds, this news bar for anchors in Midtown. Ron comes in looking all cocky, and I watch him walk all the way to the back, and he goes into the bathroom. Nothing really happens after that. That's the end of that story. Where do you even buy poison? Look, we've all done some regrettable things to get where we are today. He's just done them better. That's what makes him who he is. He's the most legendary news anchor in history. Real, actual poison. I, I just have to ask a question here. <clears throat> Who was the customer here? Was it CNN or was it uh, the movie company? It was the movie company to tune in for their movie. It seems like they both really benefited from that in a way, branding-wise. I mean, it's definitely good for Turner and CNN. Ah, uh, okay. But no, I, I think at the end of the day, that, that, that's the power of the partnership between Turner and Funny or Die. The fact that we had great access to you know, all of our anchors, and the fact they were willing to play along with that funny storyline. It, that is the power, the one-two punch, airing it on CNN, the huge distribution that they have. So I think the studio actually won at the end of the day. We just we kind of went along for the ride. The last clip we're going to show, um, this is our Webby Award winner, and this is where the product is over the top, but done very, very um, intelligently. And hopefully you'll have just as much fun uh, on this ride as you had on the last. Can't kill me, man. I'm the best there ever was. We ain't even in the same league. It's like I'm playing Halo and you're playing Centipede. Snooper Mario, brother. Ha, <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Remember, your mama told me to knock your bitch ass out. I'm licking my lips because killing you tastes good. Mmm. Uh-oh. You hear that? Must be the pizza guy. Hello? I guess you want to put down that controller and go get that hot, delicious pizza. Stick a slice under the door! Hey, look out, guys. I'm the oven. I'm gonna bake you. Bake me? Have you ever met me? <laughs> I got something for you. Smile for the camera, Snoop. I just called up the paparazzi and told him Snooky's over at your house. We are live outside the home of rapper Snoop Dogg. Say, man, I'm playing Halo. Get off my property before I let the dogs loose. <laughs> You funny, you gonna send a marching band to my house? It doesn't bother me! Can you play doing it? Hey, uh, Snoop Duggy Dug Dog, you better call up Dr. Dre, because you're gonna be in, in need of some medical attention when I'm through with you. Shut it, Chuck. Yeah, that's right, I'm Chuck. Well, actually, I, I'm actually not, I'm actually not Chuck. <laughs> that, I just play Chuck on TV. Hey, guys! I'm trying to have a conversation! <laughs> oh. oh, good, that's good, that's good. That's real classy, Snoop. Yo, Snoop, you might want to go sign for you. What delivery? Put their hands in the air. I want you on the party, Snoop. It'll be fun for you. Shit, flatbed truck full of bikini model. It's just another Wednesday for me. It's nothing. Snoop Dizzle, you've been boom dizzle. This is insane! Mom! No, <laughs> oh, it's... I'm not yelling at no mom, I'm not yelling at you. It's a guy. Oh! Yeah! Mm. Halo reach. You can't reach me, baby. You can't reach me, dog! <laughs> Triple kill. Damn! Yelling at me! Come on, what's this, man? Oh hell, man. Yeah! <laughs> now that's how Wayne Newton plays Halo. <laughs> Bitches. <laughs> Dark as shit. I'm normally so much better than this! <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so, uh... Oh. So you like that? Starting Can't again. kill me, man. So we, what I find interesting about this is, you know, in a, a previous era, you're trying to, uh, you know, promote Halo. 
you'd be getting all these different uh, ad placements and different maybe like magazines and newspapers on TV. Uh, now it's almost like you're creating a little mini show, right, of a, uh, a sitcom or something, and then it's just virally being shared around. Um, is that kind of the idea? I mean, this is like a real sea change in the way. I think that. I, in, you know, in advertising, if you could even call it that, it really is a new. I think it's a, it's a great way to get, get your message out there. Obviously, this, this video went um, sort of viral, and there's a, there's a huge payout. There's a lot of earned media that comes with it. There's a lot of pickups when this, when this happens. In fact, all these guys got together, the ending to the storyline. Uh, so I think, yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's a huge payout. Um, this also lives on. You know, when you look at it from an advertising perspective, it's, you know, it, it, it lives, it's, it's, you know, it's that short, short, short tail, long tail. And there's this there's, there's additional wave of, in this case, purchasing the product and hype behind the product. So for an advertiser, th this breaks through the clutter. It adds a lot of ROI to it. Um, we like to think of it as a big success. And then how does, uh, I'm just kind of curious, going a little bit rogue here, but how, how, do, how does uh, you know, legacy media kind of take advantage of this? Um, and I'll, 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 this is open to pretty much everybody. Um, you know, uh, there's all this content that, that's out there. How can you really, um, you know, if, if you're, say, uh, USA Today, how do you take advantage of that, right? It's, it's a different opportunity, also a challenge, in a way. I, I think you need to understand and respect your audience. Um, new media doesn't necessarily mean that uh, previous media goes away. Look at, look at the great coverage over, of wars um, over the course of the last century. If you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about World War I, um, there were great correspondents uh, who filed to, uh, to their newspapers. World War II had people doing radio from, uh, from rooftops in London. The uh, Korean War uh, had Look Magazine and Life Magazine doing beautiful, um, rich, compelling uh, still photography that, that brought empathy um, with it. And then you had uh, the Vietnam War and broadcast television coming into people's living rooms, followed by uh, the Gulf War and cable television, and then the internet and the social uh, presence with the immediacy of the uh, most recent uh, wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. With each new media, or with each new um, epic in uh, storytelling, a new media connects with a new audience. And the key is to find what the next front, front porch is going to be. Is the front porch going to be where the newspaper drops and you pick it up in the morning and read and share at the breakfast table? Or is the front porch going to be the living room where you're sitting and somebody is reading you the news on a screen? As the generations evolve, the front porch changes. So understanding the front porch and understanding the audience and how they want to consume media, I think is critical to taking the lessons of YouTube, taking the lessons of Xbox, and the lessons of the type of uh, branded media and humor um, that we've seen, and bringing it together again to build on the values and the principles that we as journalists and communicators uh, need to provide in order to sustain uh, a high level of understanding. Um, but again, if nobody's watching it, or nobody's reading it, or nobody's playing it, it's not being distributed. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that and just say, I mean, we say content is king, but distribution's queen, and she wears the pants. And that, I think, is the biggest challenge that a lot of you know, traditional content creators have. They, they only want it to live on their website. And I would say brands have this problem, too. They want to take them to one specific page and only that page, whether it's their website or some custom thing that they built, whatever it might be, where what you can learn from all of these rising stars in new media is they don't really care where you watch it. Just watch their content. And, and as long as they're monetizing it. You know, one, one, of one, of the, one of the words that you've heard um, you know, from, from my esteemed colleagues uh, 
a number of times, and I, and I think all of them have alluded to it um, or mentioned it, is authenticity. That is absolutely significant. Um, if you step back for a second and we say what has happened to uh, what some of us might call traditional media over the past decade that's enabled um, or encouraged people to go look for other avenues or to other properties or to other independent sources or to themselves as content creators and distributors um, with the uh, vehicles that now exist, uh, we might want to consider uh, the three things that you hear about when you're talking about news and how you get distribution. Have we as traditional media allowed bias to somehow creep into the business? Have we as traditional media lost the ability to create empathy with the stories that we tell? Have we in traditional media become more boring in the manner in which we present the news? And if there is some bias, and if there is some boredom, and if there is a lack of empathy, then step back and say, how do we use the authenticity to replace that in order to connect with the people that we want to connect with? What we do is necessary and great, but let's not get to capital J journalism about how it is that we communicate and distribute what it is that we're providing. We're going to get back to some of these uh, points very soon, especially about empathy and connecting with audiences and the front porch, which is, I think you just kind of did your presentation and we'll kind of show some of what you're talking about. But let's uh, talk a little bit also just about, uh, and I'm sure someone will bring this up if I don't, uh, the, there's a perception out there, and I'm not saying that I'm the one who's saying it, sometimes I, I am. Um, <laughs> that uh, you know, con con uh, branded content and you know, journalistic content, that there's this blurring, consumers can get confused. You know, can that, if that's done poorly, can that you know, create a real authenticity and trust problem and actually com you know, compound this issue of you know, lost trust in media? And how do you, how do you balance that? Because you know, some, uh, you know, some places are doing it right, many are kind of struggling and there have been some mistakes made and, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, there's not so much a, a, a straight, a, a solid wall between content and advertising or the, the content and the business side anymore. It's more of a kind of a semi-permeable layer. And anybody have you know, any thoughts about, um, you know, the, the ethics of that? How do you, you know, how, how, you, how you make sure that, also from a branding perspective, that you don't throw your brand under the bus and lose the trust of your audience for the brand? I mean, I touched upon a little, little earlier about how calling out sponsored content is, is essential and not trying to trick your audience. That's, the, that's a fatal mistake. And as Christina talked about earlier, you, you'll lose your audience. So there's nothing in it for the publisher to try to take that approach. And the advertiser doesn't want to go down that road either. So I think, I think it's, it's truly being above board and we'll go back to the word being authentic. That, that is the key to success of branded content. And yeah, look, there's always going to be a bad apple out there that might spoil the bunch for everyone else. Like, and we get, the, and then we get, we get this bad rap about, oh, sponsored content. It's, it's inauthentic. It's, you know, it's we're trying to trick, but that's not the reality. And I think the second key to branded entertainment is that we, we know the audience is really smart. Like, like we just need to be really clear about it. There's no one. Well, there's a few people that might be doing it, but no one successfully is doing it by taking that approach. So I think, I think just to take the, uh, the myth out of the room, I just don't see it. I don't see it in the marketplace for very big established brands and or publishers. All right. Uh, any uh, burning questions in the audience? I, I see a uh, hand going up and down a lot. We could have our uh, wonderful host, the microphone. Then we're going to move on to a uh, slightly different topic. Hey, good morning, Ed, and everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Kevin Delby, a Newhouse grad student and law student. Uh, just a quick question, Ed. I really like the, the Snoop video. Uh, I think we can all tell that's a Halo ad, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. Snoop Dogg, big fan of Chuck, girls in bikinis. Uh, is there a concern at any point that uh, the traditional message of buy our Halo Reach game for $59.99 is being lost with the sponsored content and everything else that's going on? And thank you. Always good to see you, my friends. 
Uh, great question. I think I think it's 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 where you put that placement. So it, is that also surrounded by which it is an ad campaign on Funny or Die that talks about you know where to buy the product, how much the product's for, and then what's the, what's the ob objective of the marketer? Was this more about branding? Was it about um, ROI? And I think we have to look at those different variables. But at the end of the day, there is an environment where you'll take that video and you'll wrap that with ads around it that will drive to that purchase. So really, you know, again, great question. There are, are there are smart ways to drive that ROI. Yeah, there's actually as somebody who works at Microsoft. I did not work on that campaign, uh, but it's just for this. This is exactly as, as Ed said. It's part of a necklace of 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 what the approach is in terms of we want to make sure there's awareness. I mean, certainly, if you go out and buy the game as a result of that, that's great. But that's not what we wanted you to come away from that particular video with. Uh, it's really just about awareness, and there's a whole other host of media uh, moves that'll make that'll hopefully drive to retail. That's not what that is all about. Again, that has to be as part of a broader campaign. All right. Well, Mitch, even though you uh, shared most of what you're going to say, I think uh, should we show what we worked on with uh, some students this summer? Um, got it. Absolutely. That 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 would be great. We're going to show a little video, but if you're interested in actually trying this out, um, uh, it was uh, we're going to have an Oculus Rift set up in the Gary Center for Media Innovation later today. Um, this was a project that came out of a collaboration with um, uh, some things I was working on really for two years, and then a student, Irfan Arezi, who I don't know if Irfan's in the audience here, uh, but uh, <coughs> it's, it's really exciting, and it's actually a first in. Uh, the media industry, in some cases, first in the world. So I'll just play the video. From the nation's cities to the cornfields and pastures of Iowa, broad changes are reshaping America and the people who feed America and the world. The farm family, with deep community roots and generations living close to the soil, finds itself at the epicenter of profound demographic, technological, economic, and environmental changes. In an exciting new project, the Des Moines Register is examining the forces that are fostering an unsettled sense of the country's future. Over five days, you'll meet four Iowa farm families and see how they are navigating a changing country. There's the Domins, a family that's been rooted on this land in southwest Iowa for six generations. The Wimmers, who are in the process of converting a conventional farm to organic, Matt Russell and Pat Stanley, a same-sex couple at the forefront of the local food movement. And Air, an immigrant from Laos whose dream of becoming a cowboy is on its way to coming true. This multimedia project from Register reporters Sharon Jackson and Danelle Eller and photographer Christopher Gannon can be experienced both in the Register newspaper and online, where you can view interactive graphics, photos, and videos of all four Iowa farms. And in a first-of-its-kind journalism project, the Register has teamed with Gannett Digital to tell this story using virtual reality technology and 360-degree video. Using the Oculus Rift, a virtual reality headset, we'll take viewers on an immersive tour of the Daman family farm. Please join us for this cutting-edge journalism experience in the Des Moines Register and at DesMoinesRegister.com. So this launched on uh, Monday, right? It's been a long week. Um, and uh, we were actually at the Online News Association conference together, and we were that booth you hear about with Oculus Rifts with people lined up for hours the entire time, wanting to go into a virtual farm. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I may kind of bring it up here and show people. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dan. and. Um, uh, a lot of what it is that we were able to do was inspired by the work that Dan has done here at Syracuse and with his students. So thank you for endowing the chair and um, helping point us in the direction. I believe that, uh, you know, that academic work in theory is important, but that it really begins to get traction when you're able to apply it to storytelling, communication, and distribution. And that's what we had the opportunity to do this summer. In looking for the next front porch, um, how many of you have 10-year-old, uh, 12-year-old, 14-year-old 
children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, uh, neighbors, um, or, 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 or friends. I have a 10-year-old son, and I know that uh, the only way I can communicate to him is through Minecraft or Clash of Clans. And I watched him play Call of Duty 3 on the Wii over the holiday vacation last winter. And at first, uh, I was concerned that uh, you know, he was um, just going to get absorbed into the game. But by the, end of, uh, by the end of it, when he had moved after Normandy through, through the French countryside, helped squeeze out the Nazis and liberate Paris, he knew more about the supply lines and the geography and the tactics and the weaponry and the strategy. And I said, why are we only doing this in fictional settings? And what if we could take real news, um, nonfiction storytelling, and embed it into an environment in which the Minecraft generation would enable us to communicate to them in a language, in a format that they understand? And that's where the other question came up which is, why are traditional news organizations suffering in terms of ratings and revenues? Well, look at the gaming industry. Look at what Larry does. Look at how many Twitter followers he has versus Wolf's Twitter following. <laughs> Maybe not as many as Ron Burgundy's, but I would argue more than Wolf's. <laughs> um, and they've made money. The gaming industry is making more money than music and movies combined, yet we're not there. So Dan pointed us, I said to Dan at the beginning of the sermon, I said, can we do this? And he said, yeah, it's easy. You just have to go to Unity 3D. It's a rendering Did engine. Did really say it was easy? <laughs> it was not easy <laughs> in the end. But, uh, you, you told, he, he, we impl he implied to me that it was easy, and I was naive enough to believe him. Um, so, uh, so we so we did, and, and we got some uh, we we got some real videos. We worked with the uh, with the team in the Des Moines. We wanted to tell a story of an unsettled America, and we told it through a family in Iowa that has been farming the same land for six generations and is worrying now that the forces of change in this country are not going to enable them to pass that farm along to the three-year-old and the seven-year-old um, who live there. But that, I believe, in many ways, is the next front porch. And I know we're going to look back on Harvest of Change in two or three years, and it's going to look like Pong. Um, but it's a first effort, and we tried to combine three technologies. We rendered the, uh, the scenes that you're seeing now in absolute explicit detail so that they would be journalistically sound. Um, right down to the types of tractors and the ambient sounds of the birds and the cows mooing and the dogs barking, so it is journalistically to, right. To the actual dog right there. And in case you can't tell, I'm going through this experience live. You can download it. Um, and what happens as you're moving through it is you will uh, come across sometimes things like this. I see that dog. There's the dog. And uh, that was then rendered, and you learn more about uh, that information. Then up here you'll have um, what I think is the, this is what's first in the world as far as we know. You have a virtual scene and it shifts you then over into the, the real reality. It's like VR to R <laughs> in the same place. Um, we weren't sure if that would work, but it did. And it's kind of a, so in, I think this is, um, I think uh, what uh, Larry Herb kind of has, has been a pioneer in really, fits in with this. So before we open up for questions, I'd like to pass it on to Larry. Yeah. Um, because this is really, um, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, I, I see this as being a real, the, the real shift is that we're now moving into the age of experiential media um, and storytelling. It's not just about telling stories, but letting people have experiences. Yeah, and that's, first of all, this is extraordinary. And you, we were talking about it on the phone last week, and I obviously haven't had a chance to look at it. This is unbelievable. Um, I mean, I looked at what you guys did there, and this is, this is, you know, better than some of the video games we had on the original Xbox, 
you know, 15 years ago. So this is really unbelievable. And this, this is exactly right. If you, if you, that environment, if you give this environment to anybody under the age of 45, they know exactly what that is in terms of how they move around with a controller, with the Oculus Rift, you know, certainly could use Kinect. There's, it doesn't matter. They understand that they're moving within a 3D environment and there's a story going place and I need to go to the little blue things and click on them and information's gonna pop up. It's, it's incredibly rich, it's incredibly detailed, and it's incredibly accurate, which is something, let me look at it, the birds are overhead, it's unbelievable. Yeah, we um, made sure we found out what the birds were and then the 3D modeler found that or created that bird. It was... Uh, How long did it take you to develop this? You, it, it was one of those things that if we had looked back and, and actually known what we were trying to do, we never would have tried to do it. Those are the best projects though. <laughs> um, we it was uh, it was a three month project, but we did it uh, we did it low cost. We did it with um, we did it with one producer, two interns, and a contractor. And the reason we used the interns is because we didn't have anybody in the organization that had ever heard of Unity 3D as the uh, you know the gaming engine, let alone knew how to use it. So the first day of the internship summer, I asked people, I said, "Come on over here." I said, "If any of you use." Unity 3D and Irfan, uh, who Dan had recommended to us, and one other guy who was a freshman at George Mason University who had spent a lot of time in high school, uh, you know, building video games when he probably should have been doing homework, um, raised his hand, and I said, okay, you guys over here. And, and we did it in about two and a half, um, three months in, uh, in pulling everything together. And one of the questions that, um, that came up this week was, why in God's name in the first journalistic effort to try to tell a story through virtual reality, would you be taking us to a farm in a remote county um, of Iowa? And the answer is very simple. We could have taken you to Mardi Gras. We could have gone to a rodeo or strapped a 360-degree GoPro array on the back of a crocodile wrestler and perhaps it would have um, been a little bit more exciting, but we really wanted to prove or find out or discover whether or not this media um, would lend itself to storytelling. And we wanted to take it seriously and we wanted to do the first um, project in an area that couldn't be viewed as exploitive uh, and uh, we really wanted to go to the heartland. Fortunately, we had group in Des Moines, um, one of our properties that was eager to, to partner with us on it, and we wanted to make it about, uh, you know, motherhood, um, apple pie and baseball, and uh, we, did, uh, we did go a little bit entertainment. Uh, we did get uh, a yeah, helicopter. You, you started out from a helicopter, just want to point out. <laughs> you come down on the farm in the That's helicopter. exactly the way a video game begins. This is, you're, you're approaching the situation. I mean, this is, this is the curtain is raising on the story. So what you guys have done here is done exactly what we do in video games in terms of how we set up the narrative. Um, and th that's what I, I'm so impressed by this. Play the, play the we, we sound have, because have, um, actually, I, I want to see if anybody recognizes the narrator. Work the fields more efficiently than any farmer's calloused hands ever have. Faces are changing the Iowa fairs, markets, and churches. Couple selling organic I'll buy a sale. coffee for Maybe the first person success. who can identify the, the price. livestock judges could be of any creed, religion, or nationality. Global pressures push farmers to use high-tech business modeling or risk losing it all to consolidation. Corporatism extends its reach when young people flee to the cities. Legacies is all. This dizzying pace of change plays out here on the dominant sixth-generation family farm. Farmed by the same family since 1901, a true century farm. As the forces shaping an unsettled America leave few untouched, this family considers its future. Worries if its next generation will even be able to carry on the traditions so strongly a part of their past. Get to know the Dahman farm and the Dahman family, and get an insider's look at their lives, and at the forces that are changing the landscape they call home. The land that feeds America. Explore the farm at will. Click on the video to reveal the history, the story, the fears, and the excitement. Look around. Look all the way around. Remember, this is a 360 degree experience. All right, anybody want to guess who, who was that? No, close. It would have been a good choice. Any other guesses? 
Anybody? Come on, come on people who watch cable TV. <laughs> Any, anybody have kids who watch, again, uh, this was all inspired by a combination of Dan and my 10-year-old son. Anybody watch Survivor Man? That was Survivor Man. That was Survivor Man. That was Les Stroud, uh, the, the, the new Bear Gorillas. So um, uh, anyway, so we, we, we went a little, uh, you know, we, we, want, we wanted somebody who knew how to use this medium uh, to help um, share. So. So that's actually a great intro, um, Dan, and I'll pick it up from here, because what we find out in video... On the, on the screen for you? Pardon me? No, oh, okay. Um, I, you know, in video games, what you've done there is exactly what we do in video games. Uh, video games are about um, emerging, putting, putting folks in the middle of it, and what we find out with our audience is they love to be in the middle of the story. They want to walk into a room or walk into a scenario and go, have the choice, can I go out that door? Can I go out that door? Can I go up there? Can I crouch down? Can I run away? They want to control the narrative, where it goes and how fast it goes or how slow it goes. And so what we do in games is that's all it is, is we're creating this, this narrative. Now what's interesting is what's different in video games versus traditional storytelling is you know that you want the viewer to get perhaps from here to Varsity Pizza a block and a half behind me, but you have no idea how they're going to do that. Which door are they gonna go out? Are they gonna get in a car? Are they gonna walk up around the block? So you need to have to have pathways and cover those pathways with interesting stories that perhaps can can contribute to the destination. So it's, it's with, with, st with story making in video games, it's about, it's 3D storytelling, not just visually, but also within the story itself, where is it going to, how are the stories going to progress and where are they going to go? It's a really, really challenging thing. I've talked to a lot of different video game writers, people that have written some of the best video games out there, Bioshock, Halo, the, uh, Mass Effect, the list goes on and on. And it's challenging for them because they have to figure out how to create this through line of the story, but also how to make it compelling that the, uh, that the gamers, the person at the center, will get eventually to the end, but at their own pace. And uh, could, could you just say a little bit about something that's really unique about Xbox is the Kinect sensors. Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan of them. I mean, this is more than just people using a game controller and having headphones on. It's, it's full body responsive. In yeah. Cases, right? So how, how does that change media? Yeah, when we, when we developed Kinect in 2000, uh, when we launched it in 2009, uh, the goal was motion gaming. Certainly the Wii enjoyed tremendous success was what they did. It was approachable. You could pick it up and you could play. With Kinect, we decided to make your body the controller. And, you know, some of the games were more successful than others. And, and to this day, actually, a lot of developers are trying to figure out how to really uh, unlock the potential of Kinect. And there's, there's not one clear path. You know, some of them use the voice recognition. Some of them are using motion and gestures. So the, the, what's awesome about the Kinect is the fact that it can do all, all of these things and, and not... not have to you don't have to worry about a controller now if any of you that are gamers if I hand you a controller you're gonna be fine you know exactly what to do but when I hand a controller to my wife she's not a gamer she'll sit there and she'll look at it she'll look at the screen she'll look at the controller I mean there's 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 upwards 20 or 30 buttons sometimes in this controller they're extremely daunting step in front of connect like you do here you don't have to worry about it it just that melts away and it becomes more immersive now it's it's the road to 3d we saw some oculus rift information earlier and Connect enables things that Oculus doesn't and vice versa. So, so what Connect allows folks to do is really just to uh, control what's on screen using a very natural, natural user interface. And uh, later today, if you're able to go through uh, the New House Studio and Innovation Center, if you go upstairs, you'll see the very beginnings of a Connect-powered uh, gesture interface wall created by Lauren Covington, who's a local developer we've partnered with. Um, and our uh, students and faculty here and in Syracuse area will be able to create content, put it up there, and we'll start to experiment with this whole idea of, of, of media moving into uh, your environment and you becoming the, uh, the experience. So I, on, on that note, I kind of, uh, the, one of the questions I have is, you know, is the world just becoming one big game, Larry? Is it like the Matrix? Well, that's all, it always has been. It always has been a, a, a game, if you think about it. Um, I mean, many years ago, it was the game of, you know, how to get into, you know, how to, you know, whether you're playing sports on the field at high school, how do you get into college? How do I get into Syracuse? That's a game. That was a stressful level for me, I'll tell you. 
Um, but but li life really is a game. What, ha what we find is that when we invented achievements uh, in 2005 and launched those with the Xbox 360, I was on the team that worked on that, it was, it, it really crystallized this. It was, you know, it was certain, we knew that people were going to do certain things in each game. Let's award them for that. And I could see that you got the achievement for, for, for beating a game on a specific, on a harder level than I did. And I, I'm going, okay, I need to go back and do that. But that's what we're noticing all around. Everyone uses this concept of achievements and, and gamification when, in fact, they've been there for thousands of years. That's really, that's really what it's all about. What we have today is we have the ability to share those achievements socially. I mean, it was, it was one thing to be successful and have this great job and this great family and so forth. But now you can, when you have achievements, you're able to share them instantly to Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and so forth. I completely concur. When, when I asked my son, I said, wh why is it that uh, you, you're so absorbed into, you know, Minecraft or Terraria or Junk Jack X or whatnot? He said, well, Daddy, he said, you can, you, you build, you survive, and you have fun. Okay. It's kind of like life. That's a, yeah, it's exactly what it is. And, and that's why that's, that's, you know, we, you know, whether, I don't know if folks know this, but, you know, we, two weeks ago we announced that we're purchasing Minecraft for $2.5 billion, which is just, I never thought I'd be involved in a $2.5 billion deal. But it is a, it is because that's where the, that's where the kids are. That's where they're learning now. It is the Legos of this and be, and future generations. My, my, my two daughters, by the way, uh, Minecraft is not just for, for the boys. One of them is a master Minecraft builder. The other one will go in and do the interior decoration, and she's really great at that. But what's interesting there is, is what we're noticing with Minecraft is that's awesome, by the way. But Minecraft is, in some sense, a virtual playground. And let me explain. Back in the day, you know, after school, I'd go out to the playground and play, play with my friends, and we'd learn the rules of don't push him, don't hit him, or this is my toy, or what have you. Now, when you're on a Minecraft server, if, some, if one of your friends comes into the Minecraft server and they wreck stuff, they're gone. Yeah. You know, they're learning social rules and how to interact. My daughters have banned all the boys from their Minecraft server. See? Exactly. They don't know how to... How to uh, they don't know how to play nice. Yeah, and then, and then there's totally different rules in the boys' servers. Yeah. Like locker <laughs> rooms. It's all like about killing so. each other. Um, all right, so uh, any, any questions? Uh, we have uh, about uh, three more minutes in the panel. Um, any questions from the audience that um, kind of burning questions? Um, not really seeing anything. Um, so I, I want to end by, so we, you know, we looked at how really all these different media forms are really kind of merging together. It's the, side of, the kind of convergence that it's a lot more messy than, uh, and, and, and organic, right, than this idea of, you know, uh, video will show up in newspapers, right? Which is kind of the old idea of, of, of convergence. And we're so far beyond that now. So, you know, looking back, you know, of the change that happened in the last 10 years, I'd like our panelists to weigh in this. And I'd also like you to weigh in. Um, and we'll be, our social media team um, this week up on uh, the, the uh, Journovation SU site, we'll tweet that out, uh, we'll be uh, curating your predictions for what will the next, what might the next 10 years be? Right? And just be bold and think about kind of what's happening, what you see now, and you know, what other trends and technologies may merge together. And you know, uh, be bold. I mean, think, you know, one thing I've been thinking about lately is self-driving cars. When you're not driving, is that the new, the new living room? Right? Because it's going to be pretty boring. <laughs> right? And then you actually could be texting while you're driving because you're not driving. So uh, I'll start. why don't we start with uh, uh, Ed, kind of go in reverse this time. 10 years from now, I mean, we're, we're, it's changing every six months, and it's amazing. So, I mean, I'm just going to keep my seatbelt strapped on and see you what's going to happen. I'm going to see what's going to happen in six months. Um, I'll, I'll make a bold prediction because I know there's probably people in the audience who will disagree with me. I don't think Facebook's going anywhere in 10 years. So get, get used to it. It's, it's only just begun at Facebook. I, over, over the next few years, I think uh, experiential journalism experiential nonfiction storytelling is going to move from uh, an innovative idea into the mainstream. I think we're going to continue to see over the next 10 years the, the, the trajectory of success specifically in the video game industry and hopefully we're going to see some merging of some of the great work we just saw and more mainstream video games so that we can get that great work out in front of more people and, and use this and I think we're headed in that direction. 
And um, I'm going to take an advertising point of view where I think that user choice is key. So uh, my prediction is that in the next five years, more than 75% of ads in video or television will be user choice or skipped. Wow, that's a bold prediction. Any other predictions? We've got uh, another uh, minute, I think. Take the mic. It's your, it's your chance to be a futurist. Syracuse wins the national championship <laughs> next year. <laughs> Woo Plus one to that. Let's, that um, I think that's a good ending note. Uh, tweet your predictions here. You can see we already have uh, stuff that's showing up. Uh, lots of things. If you follow the FD Media hashtag, um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And it's an uh, exciting rest of the day. Uh, we get to see the building open up. And uh, I want to thank our panelists for coming out here uh, through uh, flight delays and uh, just you know making their time available. So um, maybe they, if you have uh, some questions you want to ask in person, maybe they'll have a little bit of time back here, although some of them may be a little tired and need some coffee. So thanks so much. <laughs>